Hey, this is Donna Lewis here, and we are talking about happiness today. And I really look forward to hearing your feedback and um, getting your response to this really important discussion. Where does happiness come from and who is responsible for it? This talk was a spontaneous um, inspiration for me when I saw a post by a friend of mine. I think uh, Tammy uh, McBride was the one who posted it. And I'm going to share share it with you because it really um, it, well, it's what stimulated this. And I, and I thought that the statement being made in the meme was very profound. So let me just uh, go ahead and share screen with you. I also want to make sure that I'm able to see your comments as they come in. So let me just get that going here real quick. And let's see here. Okay, there we go. I should be able to see your comments now. Okay. Okay, let me just mute this. And yes, I can see your comments. They'll be coming in. There's probably going to be a little delay between uh, me being able to see your comments and respond to them. But please do engage in this important discussion. I've got some scriptures I want to share and talk with you about that are all related to happiness. And with that, let's go ahead and dive in. So I'm, I'm actually really excited about this particular discussion. Um, who doesn't want to be happy, right? Who doesn't want to experience that? Um, nobody wants to be sad. Nobody wants to, um, you know, be bummed out and discouraged. We all want to be happy, but we need to know where that comes from. We also need to know who is responsible for our happiness. So let me ask you this. Put in the comments at this point in the discussion. Answer this question in the comments. Who do you believe is responsible for you being happy? And then let's discuss what the scripture says about happiness. And then at the end of this live stream, put in the comments, Again, who is responsible for your happiness? Okay, so now these are just a few scriptures that as I dove into this subject, I came up with. And let's look at this one in Proverbs. Um... I'm going to back up though. Let's see. Well, no, let's go ahead and go here. Okay. Proverbs 16 verse 20 says this. He who heeds the word wisely will find good and whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. Okay, so I did a little bit of research and what's being said here is when the author writes, he who heeds the word wisely, he's not necessarily talking about God's word or the Holy Scriptures. It can relate to that, but it's really more, think of it this way, the person who handles their affairs wisely will find good. Whatever you're put in trust of, your family, your business, your employment, your finances, right? 
When you handle your affairs wisely, you find good. And whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. So what do we see here? Go ahead and put in, your, in the comments your insights on this particular passage. He who heeds the word wisely or handles their affairs wisely will find good. Cause, effect. Wise handling of our affairs, effect, good. Good things are the result of handling your affairs wisely. So one of the things that we're seeing here is that good events in life make us happy, create that feeling of happiness. First source is just handling your stuff with care and wisdom. And then whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. Wisdom is found in first trusting the Lord. And as a result, we handle our affairs wisely and find good. Are y'all still with me? <laughs> okay, so that's Proverbs 16, 20. Now let's look a little more deeply at what it means to trust in the Lord. We're gonna go now to Psalms 34, verses four through eight. So let me just back up here. Here we go. Okay, let's back up a little more. So I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him or trust in him, worship him, and delivers them. And here's the core of what we're looking at. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed, or another word for blessed is happy. Happy is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing a correlation between trusting in the Lord with all your being, seeking him for his counsel, his wisdom, his guidance. And then as a result of that, the fruit is a good life, a whole life, a life free of addiction, a life free of unnecessary conflict, a life unburdened by fear and anxiety. Good decisions produce good results. Good decisions are born from our trusting in the Lord. And as a result, <laughs> we are happy. We are happy. So, 
how do we sustain a heart that trusts in the Lord? Philippians gives us an insight and Philippians chapter four, verses four through eight, speak about how to maintain mindfulness of who God is and all the provision that is found in him. So let's look at that. Philippians chapter 4. And we're going to look all the way down to verse 8. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. Anxiety, worry, fear. They're happiness killers. You cannot be happy and filled with anxiety at the same time. I mean, who's tried it and found out real fast? Uh, this ain't happening. <laughs> Anxiety for me instantly kills any sensation of happiness uh, right away. It makes me irritable. It makes me difficult to be around. It creates depression, which is in stark contrast, polar opposite of happiness. Philippians, Paul's letter to the Philippians, counsels them to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Now, Paul was a person who was given many opportunities to have a sour attitude. He was working with very difficult personalities. He was in prison. He was criticized. He was antagonized. He was beaten. He certainly had plenty of ammunition to feed his fear feed his depression, feed his self-doubt. But his remedy and resource was to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to god and the peace of god which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through christ jesus and then he further counsels them to take captive their imagination, to take captive the thoughts that they allowed to enter into their mind. Did you know that you choose the thoughts that you allow to think on? I know that when you're battling complex PTSD, which trust me, I have battled complex PTSD in my life. 
but I was liberated one day when a counselor brought to my attention that I did have power to choose what I set my mind on. Prior to that counsel, my mind had control over me. My thoughts, my memories, those repetitive tapes, I just, they, they, I, I gave them full reign over me and they would bombard me with negativity, with just ugliness. But we have the power to take those thoughts captive and say, no, you do not dominate me. I dominate you. And I choose to think on these things. Verse eight, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. What we choose to focus on is going to be the difference between happiness and anxiety, doubt, and despair. When we worship, we are remembering that our source and provision is found in God. And all things are possible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. If we have need of financial counsel, we make that request known to God and he is faithful to provide us exactly the counsel that we need. If we are lonely, and in need of companionship, we can turn that request over to the Lord and he is faithful and he will provide beautiful, life-giving companionship. God is concerned with your happiness. It is a lie from the pit of hell when someone tells you God isn't concerned about your happiness, he's concerned about your holiness. That's a lie. That is a lie from the pit of hell. God loves you. Do you have a pet? I have three. <laughs> I have a cat named Muffin and a, two dogs, Zeppelin and Pink. I love them dearly. And I am deeply concerned about their happiness. 
I have three children. I am deeply concerned about their happiness. I have a husband. I love him with all my heart. And I want him to be happy always. Now, I am not a perfect human being. I am not perfectly holy. I am not perfectly good. I have a corrupted flesh just like everyone else. But yet I want good things for my dogs and my cat. I want really good things for my children and really good things for my husband. So if I, being a corrupted human being, want good things for even my pets, and then, of course, my children and my husband, then how much more does the creator who made you want you to be happy? Of course he wants you to be happy. And he knows what is going to delight your heart more than anything else. He made you. But when we are afraid that God isn't concerned about our happiness, that's when we start getting into trouble. If we don't believe God is concerned about our happiness, we're going to look to other means to make us happy. And those things are not going to make us happy. They're going to destroy us. When we worship our creator and put our heart and our mind fully upon his nature of love, his authority, which is absolute, his power, which is unsurpassed and eternal. Then we stop focusing on us. And we shift our focus to him. And he brings his confidence to the situation. And that creates a sense of well-being and happiness. So tell me, how are we doing so far? Put it in the comments. If you've got questions, if you've got concerns, if you have some insight or an example from your own life that you feel like you would like to share, go ahead and place that in the comments. I do respond to them. And if you're being blessed by this video, please remember to share it with others so that they too can experience wisdom found in the Word of God and empowerment to be happy. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's look at Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. So here is what I'm looking at as the bridge, the connecting point between us and our Heavenly Father and eternal hope. It also answers the very difficult question of how do you find happiness when you're walking through deep pain? And if God is genuinely concerned with our happiness, why does he allow deep pain? pain. 
first and foremost, all you have to do is flip on a news channel for five seconds and you will see that we live in a very troubled world. We lost the Garden of Eden thousands of years ago because the first human being, Adam and Eve, failed to trust God with a problem. That problem was Satan who invaded the Garden of Eden and tempted them to question the goodness of God. They were happy <laughs> in the garden. They were satisfied in the garden with every good thing. And Satan, the first narcissist, couldn't handle that and had to disrupt it. And he came and he infiltrated the peace of mind that Adam and Eve were in possession of to that moment and caused them to question the goodness of God. As soon as Adam and Eve took their eyes off the faithfulness of God and onto themselves, they disobeyed God and now we are experiencing what we experience today in all of the turmoil, conflict, deprivation, poverty, abuse, murder, theft, corruption that we experience today. But God, through Christ Jesus, provided a remedy for that in the person of Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, whose birth we just celebrated at Christmas. Romans 5, chapter 1 says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, we also glory in tribulations. You see, we lost Eden and all the perfection therein with sin. We continue to perpetuate that death producing atmosphere every time we fall to the same trap as Adam and Eve and take our eyes off of God and place them onto ourself to satisfy ourself. This produces the tribulations that we're now seeing. The tribulations of murder, the tribulations of illness, the tribulations of affliction, the tribulations of addiction, the tribulations of poverty and so on. And coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ connects us back to our creator, God, and all the peace and love and joy that is in him. 
but that doesn't separate us from the world we live in right now. That comes later. We still have to deal with this world and the tribulations that are all in it. Are you with me so far? But what Paul counsels us here is that even though we still are going to experience this negativity of tribulation, we can glory in that. We can actually rejoice in it and through it because there's an end game to be had. That end game is character development. I believe it was Nietzsche who said, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It is true, if you allow it. Tribulation and heartbreak will do one of two things. It will either make you a bitter, ugly individual filled with resentment and hatred, jealousy, rage, critical spirit, or it will refine you into a person of calm, courage, resilience, wisdom, patience, kindness, We can either allow the tribulations of this world to destroy us or strengthen us, but the choice lies with us. Paul wrote, we glory in tribulations knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope, a hope that does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by this Holy Spirit who was given to us. What we find here, my friends, is that we are going to go through hard times in this life. But we have a source in Jesus Christ who provides through his Holy Spirit all the strength of God in heaven. He surrounds us with his presence. He fills us with his character, we don't have to go through it alone. And we also don't have to go through it in the false belief that it's for nothing. No, there's an end game. There's an end game of goodness, even when we're suffering. And in that hope, we can rejoice. And rejoicing does become happiness. So now that we're at the end of our discussion, who is re responsible for your happiness. 
Go ahead and place your answer in the comments. And I am very curious to see the before and the after. Who is responsible for your happiness? And with that, my friends, I think we'll continue this discussion at an, on another day. Hey, Susan, good to see you. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Oh, it's good to see you, girl. So with that, my friends, I'm going to go ahead and sign off for today. Please again, like this video and share this video with others. Let me know your thoughts and your feedback. Love you much. And I think we're gonna be talking more about this in the days to come. So uh, God bless. Let me know uh, again also in the comments of what you might like to cover on this subject um, with our next discussion. With that, my friends, God bless and I love you very much. Happy New Year.